Facebook and YouTube. Dr. Madri is here and I want to welcome her and I wel want to welcome you to the heart of the matter. Dr. Madri. Good afternoon, Denise. Hi. Give me. Good afternoon, Dr. Madri. Let me just. Make sure that we're not echoing. Okay. Are you hearing me clearly? Yes, I'm hearing you very clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Wonderful. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you today? I, I'm very tired, but I'm also excited to see what the Lord's going to do today. So uh, I played way too much tennis yesterday thinking I was 25 years old and I was playing with a bunch of 25 year olds and I was wondering what's wrong with me. And when I got home, I realized I was way by far the oldest person on the whole on all, any court. I was by far the oldest person. And I, the thought crossed my mind, maybe I should slow down. The next, the next thought that came across my mind was, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about slowing down from playing tennis? It, all aspects. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to not going to give into that yet. I cannot not see you playing tennis. So I know there's no slowing down from that. That's your passion. It is. Mm. It's a beautiful game. I love it. I must say. So much of it is mental. And uh, it's, I do it for my mental health. You know, those of us that practice this as a business and as a ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, need to have uh, outlets. And this for me is truly an outlet where I can go and just have fun and let loose and enjoy hitting the ball hard. And it's, uh, it's a joy. Fully understand, fully understand. I like, uh, when I said I love it, I like watching it. <clears throat> <laughs> and that's as far as it goes. It, I, for, me, for me, it's one of the few sports that I enjoy as much watching as playing. I get every bit as much of a thrill uh, watching uh, even little kids playing. I love watching little kids play. The whole, the whole game is, is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, Denise, I, I'm still I'm still rolling around in my mind what you were just talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. The joy in waiting. I'm not exactly sure we should leave that topic quite yet. Is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Once that's where you want to go, we go there. Well, I'm just I, I'm really curious. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um uh are you good at waiting? Are you a good waiter? No. It depends. It depends. It depends. On, on what? <laughs> How long I have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that waiting in half and I'm good. <laughs> it depends on what I'm waiting for and how much it's worth to me. Um, can I say this? I used to be very impatient at waiting on people. Yeah. And because of that, I started showing up late. <laughs> That's rude. Yeah. But it depends on what it is I'm waiting for. But no matter what it is, sometimes we try to hurry the process. Or I do. The joy in waiting, that was the phrase that you used, the joy in waiting. And as you were talking about that, I was trying to think of times when I have had joy in waiting. And the first thing that came to my mind, Denise, you'll love this, was with fasting. <laughs> you know, just just the thought that, okay, we've got a time limit on this and, and pretty soon I'm going to be able to, to eat 
a, a big meal. <laughs> and that kind of gives me joy in the here and now. And sometimes with my clients, uh, I bring this topic up of um, anticipate the joy that you're going to feel when this problem has been solved. Anticipate that joy and then borrow it or, or pull it into the here and now. Does that make sense? Yes, certainly. And anticipate, let's just take for take fasting, for instance. When I anticipate, oh, it's going to taste so good <laughs> when I am, am released to be able to eat a good meal. Anticipate that joy and pull it to the right now. And that is how I can interpret joy in waiting. I, I wish I could <laughs> say that at the end of the fasting, I can, or during a fast, I can say, boy, I can anticipate that I'll be eating food. If I ever think about that, I'll be breaking that fast immediately. <laughs> ah! No, no. What I, what I, what I, um, what might be fun for me is the results of the fast, just knowing that something is going to come out of it. Yes. Waiting for that is worth it. You know, that's even better. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an even better way of looking at it, Denise. I like that. It's like right now I'm on a fast day and you're mentioning food and I feel <laughs> like I want to get up from here <laughs> to find something to eat. Mm -hmm. but I have to remind myself that there is a greater purpose behind this fast and I have to press through and I have to tell myself that every day. <laughs> yes. So anticipating the joy of obedience and the joy and the joy of pleasing your father, your heavenly father, if you can borrow that, from the future and pull it into the here and now, then the joy in waiting, for, I think, can be amplified. Can I can I give you an example of one of the joys of waiting? Yes. Going on vacation to a destination that you are looking forward to. There is a joy in the whole process of preparing to get to that place, a joy in even the airport wait to get on the plane because you know that you're going to somewhere that you really want to be. So that is my example of a good waiting time. That's good. That's very good. Can you imagine um, coming to the end of your life and let's say you're oh, in your late 80s or 90s? No, 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 no. What? Come back with some years. Mm -mm. Okay. 65. Okay. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Um, I remember my mother saying, uh, well, you know, Ma we we're saying, mom, the house is falling down. It, it desperately needs a new roof. And she said, well, the roof's are gonna, the roof's going to outlive me. There's no point in me putting on a new roof now. Somebody else can deal with it. Um, you get to a place and it's starting to happen for me where you start thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know how many more new cars I'm going to have. I, I just got a new Bible. And usually my Bibles last about 20 or 25 years. And as I was buying it, I thought, oh, I wonder if this is the last Bible I'm ever going to buy. You start thinking in those terms. Um, I wonder if the joy in waiting is, is something for the young. What do you think about that? Does it shift when you become elderly? Ah, the thing about it is that when we're children, we're racing to get to adulthood. Yes. I don't think that we've mastered the joy of waiting too well. 
to be honest with you, as a people. It is probably at that older age when we're anticipating leaving this world and going to be with our father that we, are, we become a little more patient. Especially when we see that our better years have passed and all that we worked hard for, all that we fussed about, all that we, you know, all that we thought was important really isn't because we can't take them with us. I think it is then that the patience build or it builds over time, but that's where you really see it in a person. True patience. Yeah. Or persons who are terminally ill. Very patient. Yes. When you have a life-threatening situation, you realize that all of this, all the things of this world is not as important. It's not. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's sad. It's sad that we have gone right back to where we're coming from, even after COVID. And that came to teach us patience. That came to teach us a lot of things, one of which was patience. But it's sad that it seems as if we haven't gotten the lesson because we've gotten back into this fast-paced society where we almost put God secondary again. Or he, for some people, he really doesn't matter. Very true. So what was the lesson of the pandemic? That we're not in control. <laughs> no matter what we do, there is one who controls time and season. Regardless of the theories, regardless of what was believed, what was felt, how it started, when it ended, regardless of all of that, what it proved is that we are not in control. Even if it was started by one man, we couldn't find that one man and do anything to him. If it was started in a lab, we couldn't get to that lab to burn it down. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything. We tried, but we have to let go and let God. We had to. Yes. Just now, they're starting to reflect on what the pandemic did to children as far as education goes mm -hmm. and how many years this set back the uh, education system in the United States. Um, my concern from the very beginning of the pandemic was the covering of a face with a face mask for infants and young children mm -hmm. who desperately need to be able to see facial expressions and connect them to emotional responses. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're going to quite know the effect of that for a while. Um, I know with my uh, great nieces and great nephews, um, I, I, I was concerned watching them not uh, be able to uh, respond accurately when we were all wearing masks. Um, the mental health aspect of what happened in that short period of time, I think is devastating. Um, I know that my practice just blew up and it's still uh, so impacted um, by the, the lack of control that people felt 
and st people still feel in their lives. Um, what, what do you think about that? You are absolutely right. We have not seen the full effects of it because what came out of that pandemic for our children is that they went to the computer and a lot of them are now addicts to games because what are you going to do? They do school online. Some of us parents, we weren't that tech savvy to even help them. And you're talking from the perspective of perspective perspective of the children in the USA and I'm going to come at it from a third world perspective yes please where these there many households didn't have technology they didn't ha even have electricity so when the schools went online these children had no way of learning there were times when like the teachers would get these um, studies out to central points in the community and the kids would have to pick them up. But think about a family who could hardly find food to send the kids to school in the first place to have to make this traverse to pick up these notes. Think about the children who didn't have computers in their homes, even when they were given a tablet. The parents don't know how to help them to navigate it. These children are used to face-to-face. -to -face. So here they are. These teachers are used to face-to-face. -to -face. So some of them didn't even know how to navigate teaching online. It's, it's similar to our pastors. You're teaching, you're preaching to a screen. <laughs> you don't know who is on, you don't know who is listening. But the impact of that, we won't see yet. Right. I had uh, a number of students that were clients of mine and uh, uh, I'm trying to think how many just there were a few who said I know that we're not supposed to meet in person but I've got to please please can I come to your office and I said of course and uh, the, the two in particular I'm thinking of who insisted they said, I am on the computer screen at school for six hours. I can't do it. I need, I need to talk to you. I need to be with you. And um, I also have a mom who has eight kids. And all through the pandemic, she insisted also on coming because she just needed to get away from her environment and come get some mental health uh, therapy. And before the pandemic, those of us in counseling and therapy uh, were very skeptical about how effective uh, mental health uh, therapy sessions would be using the computer only rather than being face to face. And it really did prove to us that it, it, it can still be uh, an effective therapy. It's much more effective when you are live in the same room, sharing the same atmosphere in the same space. But it is possible to get therapeutic help using the computer. And that's what's so beautiful about the computer is that you don't even have to be in the same country with a therapist. You can now have online therapeutic sessions with great success. So out of evil come forth good, because yes. here we are right now. I think God was training you and preparing you for such a time as this. Oh, <laughs> and we are offering counseling and mental health advice through a radio program. Right. <laughs> you know, that reminds me. Though we haven't seen the 
impact of what it did to our children. The first thing that, I, that we said is that we have to remember that God is in control. In the same way, he used that to bring forth this. Where here we are now on a radio station. He can do that for our children. Right. He can turn around their situations. We just need to continue to commit them to him. We need to continue to use this process to build our faith. We need to continue to use this process to trust God. Can you imagine? Can I be so bold as to take us to what Revelation describes about the coming of the Lord or Daniel? And when the world is in turmoil, and we're in that waiting period. Could we be in training for that period? Absolutely. Why not? How are you being trained for that time? See, wasn't that good? Did you see how I did that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm trained to do is ask questions and that was such a, a great lead-in statement Denise so here I am as your therapist saying Denise how are you being prepared for those end times so make this personal I feel like God is making me worthy to be able to stand before him, building my faith, should I say sanding, sanding down, chiseling off, washing, um, chipping away. I need some more adjectives to describe what he's doing because I feel like the things that he's working on are my fruits the gentleness, the patience, the kindness, the love, the self-control, the self-control. Because the self-control is going to be so important in resisting the enemy. And that's how I feel like God is preparing me while he's teaching me his word, teaching me to love to prepare others for that time. I'm in school. Does the future frighten you? No. Because? I know who holds my hands. And because of my past, to where I am, nothing about it frightens me. What might frighten me? <laughs> Can I say this without being persecuted? I never desired from I was a child, I never desired to live long. I don't want to be around when the Holocaust, I don't want to be around. I want to go to rest. I want to be one of those persons that the dead that uh, has woken up in Christ. So I don't want to be here a day after God finished using me. There's, I don't know if there's anything more for me to enjoy. I don't know. I, I keep saying that, but God keeps opening new doors and avenues and showing me new things and taking me to new places in the world to show me his beauty and his creation and keep saying you're not done yet, but I don't know. Is that weird? Not weird at all. Okay. Are you worried about the moment of death? No, not at all. 
And how did you get to that point where it has no effect on you? When I was going to Israel, the Lord showed me a vision in which I It's as if we were in a hotel. It's a hotel I, I saw when I was there. I didn't know where I was. But when I went to Israel and saw the water, I realized it was the Mediterranean Sea I was seeing. There were three columns in the water. And the tour guide came to the hotel lobby and said, I know you've heard the news of the three women who passed away in the boating accident and I don't want you to be afraid I don't want you to panic these women were supposed to be a part of your trip to the next destination you were supposed to take a boat over there But if you can find persons who would come with you, then we can make it over. I remember in that vision, I saw my friend whose house I'm staying in now. She swam up to the water, out of the water, and she said, I, c I come to help you pack to go. And I said to her, don't you want to come? And she said, I can't come with you because I just came out of the water. In that vision, I remember, you know when you're sleeping and you're taken to a next realm of your dream? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I saw myself on a plane and there was this man in, robed in white. And he was looking like a flight attendant, but he wasn't dressed like one. He was putting our things in the, my luggage in the overhead compartment. And he was fastening my seatbelt. And he said, why are you worried about where I'm taking you? Why are you worried about where I'm sending you? Don't I know that you are going? I'm not sending you on a ship I'm se or a boat. I'm sending you on a plane. And don't worry about the women who passed in the accident. I had to transition them from that life into me my arms. And the boating accident was my excuse to get them over. He said, don't ask anyone to go with you. You were asking your friend to go but she just came out of the water. In, in actuality, in reality, outside of the dream, my friend had just baptized. And he said to me, I haven't prepared anyone for the journey that I'm sending on. I've prepared you. Do not ask anyone to go with you. Wow. And from that, my reality of death changed. I was looking forward to being in heaven, to be with my mother and my sister and be reunited with my child and all of that. But no, for me, it is a transition for the people of God into the arms of God. And so I don't fear death. I see it as a beautiful thing. And especially for those who are in Christ Jesus, it is a transition in. Wow. What a beautiful gift God gave you. Yes. Yes. Can I tell you, it was part of the healing for my sister. It was the final piece I needed mm. to fully heal because I realized that she had completed her task and she had transitioned. What happened to her was just a vehicle. Those persons who did the act they were unfortunate to be used by the enemy, but her time was finished. Job reminded us, and can I tell you, part of that realization came out of Pastor Scott at Jan Riel's funeral. 
he read a passage in Ecclesiastics about the righteous not worried about their days because they know their days are numbered. And the Lord told me right then and there to take that passage to him and he opened it up for me. And the revelation he gave me confirmed the vision he had given me. That every person came to serve for a particular time, season and period. And after that is complete, they're transitioned. The question is, how well are you waiting until that time? And by waiting, it means serving. There it is again, the joy in waiting. The joy in waiting. Yes. And Jan was ready to go. I didn't have much interaction with her. Mm -hmm. I only used to see her going into her car a few times. I think I might have helped her to her car once or so. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know the life she lived. But from what I heard at her funeral... I wish I had met her and allowed her to pour into me. I do too, because um, the the listeners obviously don't know that Jan was a mental health therapist also. And I only got to meet her at the end of her life. And we had several uh, meetings together where she was just encouraging me in my journey. I had just begun my, my training as a counselor and she was so excited for me. And she had so many life tips. You know, they can train you with books and schooling on how to be a mental health counselor. But it's actually in the doing where you become a professional. And I think that's true in many different professions. But in this, this line of work in particular, um, it's, it's just learning how to navigate the questions and the different traumas that come come to you but jan was able to um convey to convey to me the joy in doing our chosen profession and so i i too wish i had had more time with her but she was ready to go she had lived a full life she had been a therapist for over 40 years and um she was weary and she was done and and she had joy in the next phase the next great adventure that was coming for her I think we all want to be like that. Oh boy. Mm. My God. If I get to that part, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be celebrating. And speaking of Pastor Scott, uh, he also gave me a wonderful gift in a sermon he was talking about, about the fear of death. And he was saying, so. Satan comes along and he starts wagging his finger at you and threatening you with death. He's threatening you with death. He's threatening threatening you with eternity with Jesus. Mm. Oh, I love that. Mm. Oh, yeah. I didn't get that one from Pastor Scott. But the person I got it from, I think it was the best that I could have heard it from. It was someone who had battled many years with cancer, in and out of the hospital, survived many bouts and stood And then he stood in church and said, while I was on my hospital bed, I saw the enemy dressed like a well-dressed butler telling me that he's, I'm going to (laughs) die. After surviving about, what, three or four rounds of cancer, he's coming to tell me I'm going to (laughs) die. And he said, I wagged my finger and I asked him, are you threatening me with a trip to my father? Yes. Do you know who that is? No. Wayne Duvall. Oh. Yes. Yes. 
what an example. After all that he's been through, he can tell you. No is on his trip. Yes, indeed. What a, one, a wonderful man of God, a mighty intercessor, a mighty yes. warrior. Yes. And, I, you know, Denise, I bet he had heard that from Pastor Scott. I think he's probably I'm the same sure person did. I was. What, you're allowing Satan to threaten you with eternal life? The the meeting of, of God face to face? Yeah, and uh, Sister Claudia says, amen. As Christians, we must not fear death. Live a life that's pleasing to God each day. And th that's exactly right. However, many of us do um, fear death because it's unknown. And again, it's releasing control. And I truly believe that when we do pass and are living eternally with the Lord, if we do have the ability to think back on our lives, this is going to look so awful. This life that we're living here that we're clinging so hard to is going to be, it's going to be a joke compared to the beauty and the majesty and the eternity of living with Jesus with no tears, with no crying, with no shame anymore. We will have taken that off and we will be living this beautiful, glorious, completed life in him. And this that we're holding on to so fiercely right here and now is going to look like a joke. We're going to think, why did I spend even one second clinging to this life? Can I tell you what you just did? What did I just do? You just released the formula for mental health. Which is? The peace of God. The hope in God, knowing that there is a greater tomorrow, knowing that the things that we're worrying about, they too will pass. Can I clarify that? Please. Not just a greater tomorrow, but a greater now. Wow. Absolutely. We have a choice. Every waking moment, we have a choice. Am I going to choose life or am I going to choose death? Am I going to choose depression or am I going to choose joy? We have a choice. That is confounding to a lot of my clients because they feel they are victims. They are victims of their emotional baggage. They are victims of their own negativity. And no one has ever said, you know, I, I would like to present to you the fact that you have a choice here. You have, you know, some people do not. And I want to clarify that. Some people do not have a choice. The depression or the anxiety is chemical and, and they cannot get out of it until a, a medical practitioner comes in to, to help balance and regulate that. But the majority of people who come into my office do have a choice to choose life or to choose death. And that is astounding to them. And sometimes the clients get it immediately and they say, yes, I get it. Yes, I choose life. Others, it takes six, seven, eight sessions before it can get into here and into here. And they realize, you know what? I can choose. And when somebody says, and I think I've mentioned this on the program, maybe a number of times. Oh, he just makes me so mad or that just makes me so unhappy. Well, you're choosing to allow it to make you unhappy. You're choosing to allow him to get under your skin. Does that sound very simplistic? Indeed. It is, it is profound. I don't want to use the word simplistic. I want to okay. use profound. Let me just take this opportunity to remind the listeners, I'm totally enjoying the conversation. I love where it's going. I love what we're doing. However, this is not about Dr. Major and I just having conversations, talking to each other. This program is meant for you to get the help that you need. So I'm asking you, I'm inviting you to jump into the conversation. You can talk about this matter or whatever it is that you're going through. 
whatever you need help with. You might not have a job and you're feeling anxious. You may have been through some childhood trauma, abuse, rape, whatever it is. You may have gone through death and you're still in the process of healing and you need help to, to find your way. No matter what it is, no topic is out of bound. The number to call is WhatsApp 825 343 4486. It's a WhatsApp number. It's 825 343 4486. Go ahead and call Dr. Marjorie. She's here. I like to say I did my time on the couch. I got the healing that I needed. It's your turn. I would love to hear from someone who can really relate to this concept of there's joy in the waiting. I wonder who out there uh, is relating to this. And there have been times where they were not so joyful in the waiting and how they helped themselves get to that point where, yes, I can honestly say there is joy in the waiting. I would love to hear stories of that. I'm wondering if Stephanie Brown would like to jump into this conversation. She said it all starts with a made-up mind to make that choice. Stephanie, give us a call. Or Claudia Johns, Johnston Taylor. She says, amen. As Christians, we must not fear death. Live a life that's pleasing to God each day. Let's talk, Claudia. You can call us at WhatsApp number 825-343-4486. The phone lines are ready for you. Go ahead and call. Jump in the conversation. Let's hear from you. While we wait on them to call... I, did I ask you, Doc, if you are patient? <laughs> no. You didn't are, ask me. <laughs> are you? It's not fair. Usually I'm the one asking questions. <laughs> I remember my mother saying to me that I was a very patient person, and I took that as an extreme compliment. This was during the days when our, our chil my children were very young and they were climbing all over me, and my mother, mother said, you are such a patient mother. And I took that as a supreme compliment. Um, and at that particular moment, I was showing a remarkable amount of restraint because I was in her house with my children. <laughs> Um, I think that I'm not very patient. Um, there is a child within me that is very prone to stomp its foot and be pretty angry when I don't get my way. Um, it's, it depends on the topic. Uh, there are things that I've been praying for for decades that still have not come to fruition. And I continue to pray because I do know that God is faithful. And so I, I give myself a real pep talk every now and then when I get tired of, of praying about this particular topic. But I know I'm to pray without ceasing and, and continually offer it up. So let's see. There's, there's areas where I'm not very good. Um, if there's any kind of pain or suffering, <laughs> I'm not very good at being patient. I'm not a good sick person. Oh, oh, it's just, it's horrible when I have a cold or the flu. Um, a little over a year ago, I got COVID and my family got COVID and they bounced back, but it took me 16 long days of just lying in my bed and feeling sorry for myself and 
uh, you know, texting my friends saying, can you bring me some toast? Because my family, they'd all go off and work and I was left by myself and I was not very kind. So when it comes to physical pain or suffering, I'm not that patient. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm much more patient. I think it's because I, I so trust my Redeemer. I so trust my God. Um, and I have a track record with him. Isn't that what really helps us in the long run there, Denise, is the track record we have with God. We know he's faithful because we've seen it again and again and again and again. It is. The more he proves himself to us, the more we see his hand, the more we experience his miracles, is the more we trust him. And I believe that's what the patience is about. I am most impatient when I'm hungry and when I'm tired. Those are the two times I can tell you I don't like to wait. Yes. Another part of this, oh, did I interrupt you? No, go ahead. Another part of this is I'm a very strong woman. and. I can make things happen. Now that's that's a really good trait, but it's also a very bad trait because I can push things through and get Ishmael's, if you know what I mean. I can make an Ishmael happen really easily. So when you ask, am I a patient person? Uh, that's that's the the um, that's the dilemma for me is that I know I am capable and I can make something happen. Getting my hands off of it and allowing the Lord to do it and allowing the Lord to give me an Isaac rather than an Ishmael, That's I'm still learning. I'm still learning even at this old age. I'm still learning how to get my hands off and allow an Isaac to develop rather than an Ishmael. Do you ever do that, Denise? Can I remind you? <laughs> Trying to get it off me and push it back on you. Can I remind you of something that you once said to me? What? God had to bring you to the most materialistic country in the world to remind you of your need for him. That changed my life. I hope that answers your question about the Ishmael. <laughs> yes, I was able to do for me and not depend on God. And so it caused me to act independent of him. Just choose him when I needed him but he brought me to a place of surrender by stripping away everything that I thought was important. Me too. Me too. Claudia, Claud, sorry, Claudia says, unfortunately, she's having dinner. She'd love to call, but she's having dinner, so she can't talk right yeah. now. That's fine. I remember uh, quite a while ago, I said to my, my dear friend, I want to get to a place where the first time God suggests something to me, I take him up on it rather than saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what started as a suggestion on, on something to tweak in my life. So give me that first suggestion. If I don't take him up on it, he will come at me a little harder about it. And if I still resist, he will come at me with a two by four and hit me over the head with it. And I said to my friend, I want to get to a place where the first suggestion is what I take him up on rather than getting to that point where he has to hit me over the head with a two by four. So I think that that harkens back to what you're asking about 
um, uh, am I a very patient person? I am learning, still learning, how to, at the first suggestion of, you know, Margie, it might be a good idea if you don't do that <laughs> again. I want to take him up on that rather than having to get to a place of great pain and then change. Oh, Lord, please continue to work on me. <laughs> continue to mold me. <laughs> yes, we. I, I definitely would like to get to that place. But I'm in the process. Yeah. So did I answer your question? Yes, you did. You certainly did. Okay. You certainly did. Thank you so very much. A roundabout way of answering that. That was a really good question. You should be a therapist, Denise. I'm learning from you. <laughs> I think you are. I think you, uh, not learning from you, but you are already doing so much good therapeutic work through this broadcast. Because really, isn't it in developing our relationship with the Lord that we become healthy mentally, spiritually, physically? Yes. It's, it's building that intimacy and that relationship that, that helps us to take off the bitterness, take off the anger, take off the fear, um, and become well mentally. Uh, Doc, can I interrupt for a few minutes of this whole segment? And can I ask you to pray for Pastor Steve, please? Yes. Just healing. Is there anything specific that we need to know? I will talk to you after. Okay. Right now? Yes, please. Father God, you see Pastor Steve. You see him right now. You are holding his hand. You are right there with him. I pray that all fear would disappear. Any anguish would disappear, Father, that he would know that you are present with him, and that you are carrying him down this road, Lord. We thank you for his faithfulness. We thank you for his life, which is dedicated to you. We thank you for how he teaches us. Even when we're just sitting next to him, he is in teaching mode. Yes. He has dedicated his life and his family and his ministry to you, and you honor that. You love him with a profound and deep everlasting love. Put your arms around him right now, Lord. Comfort him, protect him, defend him. Let him know you as mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Father, whatever's happening right now, we just commend it to you, knowing that you are right there with him. That's a man who has no fear. That's a man who has no uh doubt about your majesty and your glory. So we ask right now that you just hold him in your arms. Hold him tenderly, Father. We commit him to you, knowing that he is yours and that we are yours and that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' most powerful name, amen. Amen and amen. Dr. Marjorie, it's just about five minutes before we go. Is there anything that you'd like to say to wrap up this session on mental health? Yes. As I was praying for Pastor Steve, um, this is just something that, that continually comes up in my mental health practice, that the deeper your intimacy with the Lord, the more profoundly healthy you are mentally. When you 
purpose yourself to know him and to worship him and to give thanks and to release all that you are to him, the things of this world just sort of fade away. They don't become as important and devastating as they are when you are clinging to this world and what you know to be true. So if you are having any kind of mental anguish right now, anxiety, depression, um, any kind of insecurity within yourself, draw near to him. He's waiting for you and he is, is there to lift you up and to heal you and to make you well. So there is a direct correlation I have found to deeper in the intimacy and and um, more stable mental health. He has a name. He has a name. Many names. <laughs> Which one in particular are you thinking of? The Son of God. Jesus. Yes. 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 Hey, it seems like Elizabeth Geiger is listening to us. Hello, dear one. <laughs> I'm glad you're here with us. Stephanie Brown, yes. You can, just, you can just go ahead and shout out all the persons who are on. Those are the only two that I can see. Claudia. Mr. Smooth, hi, Andrea. Hello, Andrea, we see you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, go deep with him, you guys. Go deep with him. Allow him to be your lover. Allow him to be your, your friend, your, your best friend. Just allow him in. The deeper you allow him in, the healthier you are going to be, spirit, soul, and body. Thank you, Elizabeth. So you shout out those who are listening on Facebook and YouTube, but there are so many more on hgradio.ca. So Dr. Majin, we're going to close out the program today. Okay. My privilege to be here, Denise. Thank you so much. And you have to acknowledge the co-drivers who are on AGG Radio, those who are listening on Facebook, those who are listening on YouTube. You're closing out the program today. So you're going to thank them for joining, for listening. Everybody, everybody within the sound of our voice, we love you. We are so appreciative that you showed up. Uh, maybe next time you'll get the courage up to call. Because I love to talk to people. That's what I do. I love to ask questions and just and encourage you, encourage you in this walk to become more intimate with the Lord. So come come on, talk to us. Um, we're here for you. And until you call, I will continue to grill Denise with my questions. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is where I make the appeal for you to call. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, my, my clients who are listening, it'd be a great opportunity to get some free counseling. Indeed. And no one has to know that it is you calling. Right. You don't have to identify, as we often say on this broadcast. That's right. Stephanie Brown is responding to you. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. McWilliams. You are so welcome, Stephanie. I hope you got something from this. We were kind of bouncing around between all kinds of things. Death, fear of dying, uh, old age, uh, the joy in waiting, all kinds of good stuff today. But I, th I think the central theme that I heard coming out was mental health, how these are affecting your mental health. How is waiting in the process of dying, in the process of, you know, a pandemic in the, uh, and how is the joy of waiting coming about through yeah, your patience? Yeah. yeah. I want to thank you for coming and sharing with us, Dr. Madri. 
I want to thank you so, so very much for your wisdom. Thank you for your availability. And thank you for your willingness to share with us and to take us or to get into the heart of the matter for us. You are so, you. so welcome. It's only because of Jesus. Yes, uh, indeed. On my own, I, I'm i nothing, but it's through the lessons that he gives me every day and the experiences that I've had with him. That's what, what makes me a mighty warrior. That's what makes you a mighty warrior. Indeed. Mr. Smooth J.A. said, I got in late, but I got something from it. Good. So glad. And she said, thank you for this. You're welcome, Mr. Smooth. <laughs> we bless God for you and you and you who are joining in on YouTube and Facebook and on AGG Radio. I invite you now to go over to aggradio.ca because I have to pull things down from YouTube and Facebook, as I often advise. We can't play the music here. I don't know if you want to read that last one before we go. Stephanie Brown, I got a lot of golden nuggets. Lovely, 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 lovely. Yay, makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings, Minister Denise and Stephanie. Blessings to you too, Stephanie. Thank you so much. All right, this is where we pull things down from YouTube and Facebook. It is just about that time for Adventures in Odyssey. And so this is where we're going with the broadcast just about now. Right after these messages. Dr. Madri, thank you again for coming and sharing. God bless you. I pray the blessings of the Lord upon you. I pray that his grace and favor, and all good things, abundant blessings, abundant blessings to you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I receive it. Thank you. Love you. Bye-bye. Too late to tell me that God is not real. Come and expect a blessing, healing, deliverance, and a breakthrough, and a word from heaven. That's expectation. Mondays to Fridays at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time with Pastor Dean A. Brown out of Bronx, New York. This is your pastor, Pastor Clive Atkinson, coming to you with a brand new show called The Higher Man Morning Show. That is every Saturday from 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. We'll be having guest speakers. We'll be doing live shows. We'll be having just talks. The Lord bless you. Come on out. Let's listen. Let's tune in to HGG Radio. <laughs> Hey, chosen generation, get ready for the Saturday Hub, where it's all about the youngsters. We are a chosen generation. Join me, Auntie Renee, inside the kids' block, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. MST. Come learn the word of God. Share the love of Christ. Read your Bible. Hey, 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 kids. Read your Bibles. Pray and play. Youths, we've got you covered. 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. With the Youth Spot. Log on for some awesome song selections. Uplifting and encouraging words just for you. Right here inside the Saturday Hub, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on HGG Radio, reaching you at the highest mountain and the lowest valley. In Join me, Pastor Kola Kero, every Tuesday, 5.30 to 6, with the program With God All Things Are Possible, We Go Tap. It's a time for you to look up to God and trust Him for great and mighty things. God is able to do exceedingly and above all that you expect. Every Tuesday, 5.30 to 6 o'clock, please join Higher Ground Gospel Radio Station. Let all be
The Bible says in the book of Psalm 107 verse 20, He sent His word and His word healed and delivered. As you come, the word of God will heal and deliver you in Jesus' name. As you come, trust God to do that which you have been trusting Him to do in your life in Jesus' name. It is now seven minutes after three here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where I'm broadcasting live from Studio 4. It is seven minutes after 2 p.m. in California and those on the Pacific time. Seven minutes after four in Jamaica and Central time. Seven minutes after five on the East Coast. And it's now time for Adventures in Odyssey. Adventures in Odyssey is brought to you by Focus on the Family. Hi, this is Chris. Welcome to Adventures in Odyssey. 